Hello, I'm John Dorney, and I'm very happy to be speaking here at the Fingal Festival of History in 2021. So it's 100 years on from momentous events in Irish history, the Truce of July 1921 and the Anglo-Irish Treaty of December 1921. What I'm going to be speaking about today is how we got there, the peace process, to borrow a term from later Irish history, of 1920 to 21. And the subtitle I have here is The Unnecessary Number of Graves. Now, this is a quote from Warren Fisher, who was the head of the British Civil Service of all of the UK at the time of the truce. And he said, better late than never, I suppose, in reference to the truce, but I can't get out of my mind the unnecessary number of graves. So I'm going to be talking a little bit kind of from the British point of view in the peace process, because there is a story here uh, of the people on the British side who viewed the war as unnecessary from their side. They said the obduracy and the militarism, as they put it on their own side, delayed the truce and the treaty and led to, as Fisher put it, the unnecessary number of graves. Now, before I do, just a quick recap of how we got from constitutional crisis to guerrilla war to truce and treaty. Well, we went from home rule to republic. Now, home rule was limited autonomy within the United Kingdom, promised in the Home Rule Bill of 1912, uh, would have satisfied the moderate nationalists of the Irish Parliamentary Party, led by John Redmond at the time, even though it was far less than Irish independence of 1921, but it was blocked by unionist resistance in Ulster, 1912 to 14. And as a result, uh, rival paramilitary groups were formed, Irish, poli Irish politics was militarized, temporarily shelled by the First World War, but leading to the rising we see in the picture here, the burned out GPO in 1916, the ascendance of radical nationalism, separatism, as evidenced by the rising of 1916. Following that, you have the conscription crisis where there's a broad kind of nationalist mobilization against the war. So the moderate nationalists of John Redmond had of course promised to support the war in 1914. That all is dried up by 1918. There's a mass mobilization, there's a general strike, there's a pledge that's signed by a million people to resist conscription. And from this really, and the aftermath of the rising and executions and so forth, comes the ascendance of the radical nationalist party, the separatist party, the Republican party, Sinn Féin. So this map here is of the election results of 1918. So Sinn Féin won 73 seats, almost all the seats in the south of Ireland. There is uh, the light green there is the Irish Parliamentary Party and the, the other ones are the Unionists. Uh, in the north, of course, the Unionists have a stronghold. They take 22 seats. Um, but Sinn Féin boycotts Westminster Parliament. So quite unlike the Home Rule Nationalists of the previous era, they won't go to Westminster and they set up their own parliament, the Dáil, which first met in January 1919. Some of the key players we have in this photograph, we have on the left, Arthur Griffith looking across, Eamon de Valera, the president of the Irish Republic as established in 1919, Michael Collins, Minister for Finance, but also Director of Intelligence of the IRA and Harry Boland. Now, not so much Boland, but the other three are, are kind of central to, to our story here. On the other side, we have David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister. Now, there's a lot to say about Lloyd George. He's a central player here. Lloyd George is a liberal, but by 1919, by the time the first doll is declared and the Irish War of Independence begins, Lloyd George is the head of a government which is majority conservative. The conservatives are close allies of the Ulster Unionists. So it's impossible for this government to deliver uh, self-government, let alone independence for Ireland. That includes the Ulster Unionists. The Ulster Unionists are very closely tied in with the conservatives who are Lloyd George's coalition partners. Secondly, Lloyd George views the situation as home rule had been promised to Irish nationalists, he's prepared to go through with home rule. Remember, home rule is not the same as independence. Home rule is limited autonomy within the United Kingdom. Further than that, Lloyd George is not prepared to go. He, he's prepared to have uh, home rule for the South, the Unionists staying within the United Kingdom, or as it turns out eventually, home rule all around, home rule in Dublin and Belfast. He's not prepared to go for Irish independence. The political problems are home rule has been promised since 1914. It's on the books, in fact, before the First World War, but it hasn't transpired because of unionist resistance, because of the First World War. And the unionists will not accept it. They will not accept it, first of all, for all of Ireland, but they have a backup position, which is they won't accept it for the six counties in which they're the majority in Northern Ireland, or more or less, Fermanagh and Tyrone partly have a small nationalist majority, actually. Republicans, however, had won the majority and were boycotting against British institutions from January 1919. Now, not only boycotting the Parliament, but also boycotting the courts, setting up their own courts, boycotting the police, setting up their own police, the Irish Republican police, 
Britain wants to move Irish demands back to home rule. So interestingly, and it's important to note, that the British government doesn't want to move back to the situation prior to 1912. What they want to move back to, if you like, is the situation as it would have existed in 1914. So home rule, limited autonomy. This means no control over the army, the police, foreign policy, taxation, and so on. Um, but there would be a parliament in Dublin. Now, initially, um, the British kind of political establishment both in London and the establishment in, in Dublin Castle and the administration in Ireland, thought that Sinn Féin's position is basically a bluff. They'll come and they'll negotiate and they'll move them back to home rule. But that's not what happened. The situation radicalised with a growing insurgency, so a guerrilla war from early 1919. This man, Sir John French, he was a military man, was made Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in 1918, at the time of the conscription crisis, uh, very much favoured... Uh, the suppression of the separatist movement. And he wanted even to forget about home rule. He was an ardent unionist. His family were um, Irish unionists originally from County, Long or County Roscommon. Um, the structure of British rule, again, is interesting to note. People often talk about Ireland under the union as being governed from London. It wasn't really so. Um, the Lord Lieutenant, John French pictured here, is representative of the King. Now, generally, this was a symbolic position, but not in this particular time, because Sir John French was given the powers of basically a military governor under wartime legislation. Normally, the head of the Irish administration, if the chief secretary, who was appointed uh, by the incumbent government in London, and the undersecretary, who's head of the Irish civil service in Dublin Castle. Now, it's important to note because the Irish government, and this people refer to it as that, was, was in Dublin Castle, but it wasn't elected by anyone in Ireland. It's basically an undemocratic um, administration. Now, the people in charge from 1918 to 20, Sir John French, I've talked about, Ian McPherson, the chief secretary, are convinced unionists. So they don't really even want home rule. Um, delivered. They're not in a state of mind to negotiate with the separatists. And they wanted repression. So they wanted um, martial law declared. They wanted internment uh, of, of suspects, which they partially got. And Lloyd George, or sorry, excuse me, Sir John French wanted federalism. So retreat from home rule. Federalism is less autonomy again, less independence than home rule. What the government comes up with in 1919 is the Government of Ireland Act. It's passed in December 1919, comes into law the following year. There's two home rule parliaments, so one in Dublin and one in Belfast. What we see here is a street riot in Belfast is from July 1920. Um, Belfast becomes extremely violent as well. It's another angle of the conflict in Ireland, the conflict between nationalists and unionists in Belfast. Southern Ireland is the rest, the 26 counties, that goes on to become the free state. Northern Ireland has a majority unions population, and elections are to be held from May 1921 to the two parliaments. So this is the solution that the London government wants to have in Ireland. They want to have two home rule parliaments. They say this will satisfy everybody. And they want to have elections to this, so it will be formally passed into law by May 1921. Now, the problem that they have, of course, is that the ascendant political movement in the south of Ireland, Sinn Féin, and their armed wing, really, the Irish Republican Army, they don't accept home rule. They don't accept partition of Ireland. So what the British government's strategy, what they're trying to do ostensibly is enforce this solution, home rule for Dublin and Belfast. And because we can see the proposed partition and the election results of 1919 are quite closely correlated, but not completely. So we see in the west of Northern Ireland, for example, is nationalist Fermanagh and Tyrone, Derry City, also the southeast of Northern Ireland, you know, Newry, South Armagh, that area. First of all, they do try repression. They arrest many Sinn Féin activists, uh, including De Valera, the president of the, of the Dáil. Um, the Dáil was banned as an illegal assembly in September 1919. The military began mass arrests in early 1920. Now, the, military, the British military, when they're looking back at this period, write that if we had been given a free hand, if we continued these mass arrests of Sinn Féin and Republican activists, we would have squashed the rebellion, as they saw it, uh, in the spring of 1920. That's not what happened, though, because the prisoners began a mass hunger strike in March 1920. Interestingly, it was started by a Labour activist, William O'Brien, and then uh, taken up by Republican prisoners in Mount Joy. Um, there was a general strike in support of the prisoners by the Labour movement, and all the prisoners were released. Now, it was a, a fiasco from the point of view of the British administration because they didn't want prisoners to die on hunger strike. So, first of all, uh, Sir John French, who at the time is the head of the administration as Lord Lieutenant, uh, says, well, we'll free the ones who haven't been convicted of a crime. And then there's a big mix-up, and, and they end up freeing them all. So this only emboldened the kind of, the kind of Republican uh, insurgency against British rule. It also came to the British government's attention from the, this failure that the people who they had assigned to settle the situation in Ireland to their satisfaction weren't doing a very good job. So they sent over a whole new team to head the uh, 
British administration in Ireland in Dublin Castle. Warren Fisher, who's the head of the civil service, does a report into the administration, and he says there's chaos. He says they're woodenly stupid, the people running the administration in Dublin Castle. He says it was never very good, and now it's hopeless, or, or, or words to that effect. But there's new blood brought in, and this team here we have on the front, the front three here, on the going from uh, left to right, we have Sir John Anderson, who was a very senior British civil servant. He's put over to as undersecretary. Uh, Andy Cope, who it w is the next one from the left. Andy Cope is um, a detective in the finance, uh, the revenue department. But he, Andy Cope is going to play a pivotal role. I'll come back to him. And Mark Sturgis. Um, and these three are very much associated with the idea that there must be peace talks, real peace talks. And we can't just say, well, you're going to get home rule because you have to engage with the demands of, of the Sinn Féin movement. They're, what they're recommending from April 1920. Now, remember, there's, there's violence for well over a year after this, but what they're recommending is Dominion Home Rule. This means the same level of independence as Canada and Australia. Okay, so it's very close to what's offered in the treaty. The bones of it are in April 1920, these people are recommending. A new military commander in chief is appointed, Neville McCready. Neville McCready had served uh, as a senior officer in the British Army, but also as the head of the London Metropolitan Police. Now, interestingly enough, McCready flip-flops a few times between repression and conciliation, but when he sent over in April 1920, McCready said, the situation has gone too far for any coercion to work. So McCready is, at the start, on the same page as these civil servants. He says, we have to try talks. Now, the face of the official position of the British government is that there can't be any talks. You can, we can talk on the basis of the Government of Ireland Act. In the meantime, they're just the murder gang and so on. Uh, in Sinn Féin and in the IRA, you can't talk to them. Um, these are the issues. There's the partition of Ireland, which obviously the Sinn Féin movement is against, uh, but which is already passed into law in the Government of Ireland Act. In fiscal control, so if the Irish government could collect its own taxes and so on. Membership of the British Army and loyalty to the Crown. Um, again, the Republicans won't accept this. Control of armed forces and police. So, by offering Dominion Home Rule, this is April 1920, the civil servants are saying we have to give way on all these issues. We have to make some compromises, except maybe membership of the British Empire. Beyond that, they're not, they're not prepared to go. But first, they had to find a way to stop the fighting. The stated policy, as I was saying, was, was this. Preliminary to proceeding with the government policy of granting self-government to Ireland, it is first necessary to restore respect for government, enforce the law, and above all, put down with stern hand the Irish-German conspiracy. So this is in reference to the First World War. It's at the time of the conscription crisis. Um, Lloyd George is also sensitive to charges that the Liberal government in 1916 had allowed the 1916 rising to happen. They hadn't disarmed the volunteers before the rising and so on. And he's determined not to show this weakness again to the Conservatives. But Lloyd George is forever a slippery customer. So he says one thing in public. Behind the scenes, however, he sends over this man, Andy Cope, who I mentioned before. Andy Cope is a man of working class origins. He would work his way up as a detective in the customs office, which is, you know, I'm not exactly sure what the detective in the customs office did, but it was an important position in the revenue department. Now, Cope's job was a very sensitive position. He had to make contact with Michael Collins. So De Valera by this time had gone to America. Uh, Collins is identified, although not formally head of the Republican movement. He's the main moving figure. Uh, Cope's job is that he has to make contact with Michael Collins. Um, and Collins from this time, from this very early stage, says that tells the IRA that Andy Cope is not to be touched. No one's tried to try to assassinate him or capture him. Now, throughout the period, so from May 1920 all the way through the, the peace process, Andy Cope is talking to Michael Collins. So while the British government is saying we can't talk to these people, they're murderers and terrorists and so on, they actually are talking to them the whole time. On his own side, Cope comes in from a lot of criticism. So McCready, the military commander, said, I cannot share his ideals, but I always admired the way he hung on to the dangerous and disagreeable task. Now, apparently he used to meet Michael Collins in a room on Abbey Street. In the short term though, so I talked about these doves, if you like, the peaceniks in Dublin Castle. In the short term, they lost the argument. Why? Because there's another faction in the Dublin Castle administration, particularly Hammer Greenroot was made chief secretary. Now, Sir John French, the Lord Lieutenant, is still there, but he's sidelined. The senior official becomes Sir Hammer Greenwood. Uh, and Henry Shooter, who's another former military man, is made the head of the police. And then the police, by this point, um, are unrecognisable from the pre-First World War RIC. They're bolstered by the Black and Tans and from uh, the late summer of 1920, the Auxiliary Division. Um, and these people are of, the, are of the view that before we talk to Sinn Féin or the Irish separatists, we have to crush the campaign of outrage, as they call the IRA campaign. So there's no, going to be no talk, as far as these people are concerned, until the outrages, the murder campaign, as they call it, is put down. And they win the argument in the short, short term. They convince Lloyd George that this is the way to go. First repression and then talks. 
So instead of talks in the August of 1920, you have the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act passed. The Restoration of Order Act has been described as a halfway house to martial law. So um, the military has the right to arrest people, but they still have to give them a military trial. Um, Lloyd George and Winston Churchill opted for this, as I said, replaced ordinary courts with military courts. So even civilians are tried by the military. Um, and allowed for internment and execution. Now, it's not the full martial law where the military can just sign off on these things, which happened later on, but it's, it's part of the way there. It also um, had an unofficial effect, which was the explosion of kind of reprisals, especially by the new police units, the Black and Tans and the auxiliaries. And this is a, this is a picture of some auxiliaries in Dublin, and you see there with their semi-military, semi-police uniforms, with their mixture of weapons and so on. But there's a season of reprisals that starts in September 1920, you know, late summer, September. 1920. Um, so starting here in North County Dublin with the sack of Balbriggan, or this is not the first actually, but the, the first headline one, where in re reprisal for the shooting of two policemen, fatal shooting of one of them, uh, large parts of Balbriggan were burned out by, by a force of police, by RAC and auxiliaries. Renin in County Clare, this, the village again was burned out in reprisal for an ambush in which a number of police were killed in West Clare. And this is pretty much the case throughout Ireland. Now, as the, this escalation on the British side also causes an escalation on the Republican side because the IRA becomes much more kind of streamlined. They form these flying columns, active service units, full-time units, um, and they start to, to become a lot more ruthless themselves. But at the same time as this escalation is happening, there's another part of the British administration saying that this is terrible. This is moving us further away from where we want to go. And also by these reprisals, by burning down people's houses and so on, uh, burning down businesses, especially in places like Balbriggan, for example, they burn down the factory. Um, in rural Ireland, they typically burn down the creamery. This is counterproductive. This is getting more people onto the Sinn Féin side. It's the opposite of what we want. Now, Cope, Andy Cope, as I said, is through, in contact with Collins around this time. There's also back, ch back channel talks between Lord George, the Prime Minister, and Arthur Griffith, who is the President of the Republic in de Valera's absence, via uh, Patrick Moylet and C.F. Phillips, so two, two Irishmen in London. And Griffith proposed a ceasefire in return for the doll being allowed to meet. Now, remember, the doll had been outlawed, had been outlawed in September 1919. This is the following year. And Dahl says, we'll have, we can have a ceasefire if the doll is allowed to meet and an Irish Republic will not be mentioned. So what Griffith is sig signaling here is, we're prepared to compromise on the Irish Republic. Uh, we can, we'll settle for something less than that if we have a ceasefire and if the doll is allowed to meet without hindrance. In the middle of these these back channel talks however you've got bloody sunday so the michael collins and the dublin brigade's assault on british intelligence agents in dublin what we see here in the left is british intelligence officers who were killed that morning there were nine intelligence age officers i believe among the 14 killed that morning and the following week you have the Kilmichael ambush in county cork where a whole patrol a whole company of auxiliaries is wiped out by a ira flying column led by tom barry now these aren't the only actions around the country but they're they're such kind of dramatic events and also, you know, you have the British reprisal on Bloody Sunday, of course, where 14 people are shot in Crow Park. These are such dramatic events that they make, again, the negotiations more difficult. You see here, these are some of the uh, British officers killed on Bloody Sunday being brought back to Dublin's North Wall. Now, one mistake I think has been made in some of the histories of the period is to say that this escalation of violence sabotaged the peace process. It's not true, actually, because Lloyd George wrote to Griffith, again, via these intermediaries, such as Patrick Moylet, Ask Griffith, for God's sake, to keep his head and not to break off the slender link that has been established. Tragic as events in Dublin, it's a bloody Sunday, tragic as events in Dublin, in Dublin were, they are of no importance. These men were soldiers and took a soldier's risk. Now, interestingly, Lloyd George had a terribly cold-blooded attitude towards his own soldiers. For example, when Sir John French, who I mentioned before, the Lord Lieutenant, was nearly assassinated by the IRA in Dublin in December 1919, Lloyd George's only remark was, well, they're bad shots. And similarly, you know, he said these men were soldiers and took a soldier's risk. So I, mean, I suppose Lloyd George had been Prime Minister through the latter stages of the First World War and the deaths of soldiers was something he got used to. In any case, Griffith was actually arrested and imprisoned after Bloody Sunday. And one interpretation of this is actually they took Griffith in so he couldn't be touched by some of the wilder elements of Crown Forces so they would be kept safe. He was in Mount Joy for most of the following months. However, you know, the back channel meetings, some Moylet meeting with Phillips, went on every day. Uh, there was some cracks in Sinn Féin. So Michael O'Flanagan, a priest who was the vice president of Sinn Féin, now it's kind of an honorary position, but he's, he's not really important in the movement in terms of its leadership, but he is a very prominent public figure. Michael O'Flanagan says that there should be an IRA ceasefire and that we might, be, might accept partition. Um, Sweet Men at TD in County Wexford says the IRA sh campaign should stop and so does Galway County Council. These are all Sinn Féin uh, politicians. So 
the hope of Lloyd George begins to come. Well, if we apply enough of this pressure, these reprisals and so on, the arrests, the, the killing and the execution of Republican activists, we can cause a split between moderates and extremists and we can talk to the moderates, becomes the hope. But they have another go at these back channel negotiations in December 1920. Now the, the man here is Archbishop Clune. He's the Bishop of Perth in Australia. He was the uncle of one of the men murdered in Dublin Castle by the auxiliaries on the night of Bloody Sunday, actually, Connor Clune. Uh, however, he offered to mediate, mediate the following month um, in cooperation with, again, these pro-peace people in the Dublin Castle administration, so Mark Sturgis and Andy Cope particularly. He meets Lloyd George and he meets with Michael Collins and he meets with Arthur Griffith in Dublin. He acts as an intermediary. And Lloyd George makes a formal offer of a truce with Dominion Home Rule. So again, moving beyond Home Rule to something like Canada and Australia have to Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins. And at this stage, Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith say, yes, we can have a ceasefire and we can have talks on that basis. But it breaks down. Uh, Lloyd George doesn't want to accept that Sinn Féin are the representatives of the Irish people or, or an Irish Republic. He wants to also include Labour in the church. So he wants to include Sinn Féin as one representative, but not the only one. And more importantly, though, he says, all the IRA arms have to be surrendered. And there has to be a list of, t IRA, of TDs or members of the Dáil who are also IRA officers, and they can't sit in the Dáil if it's allowed to sit again. So this goes down badly. Um, Greenwood and Tudor, and by this stage, McCready, the military commander in chief, are, are saying, we can't have talks before the IRA surrender its weapons. It would be a defeat for us. Um, McCready asked for martial law to be given more time. So martial law was declared in Munster, in late 1920, this is full military rule, and he asked for it to be extended and to be given time to crush the rebellion. On the Irish side, Arthur Griffith says there will be no surrender no matter what frightfulness used. So we're not going to give up our weapons. We're not going to agree to um, excluding IRA TDs from the Dáil. Michael Collins sends back the message via Bishop Clune. Lloyd George wants capitulation. Let, let Lloyd George make no mistake, the IRA is not broken. So they're prepared to, they're prepared to compromise, but they're not prepared to surrender, is the message that Collins and Griffith send back. And Greenwood, as I said, the chief secretary, the, the hardliner, says coercion is the only policy. And so you have six, seven more months nearly of fighting. And this is the bloodiest period of the War of Independence after this. Um, so what we have here is a typical picture of the British Army searching a, a, a civilian in Dublin. Um, the British Army is deployed in greater numbers, so there's less reliance on the, you know, the police, the so-called police, the auxiliaries and the black and tans and so on. There's more regular British Army sent in. And there's official reprisals, so they tried to discourage the kind of wild reprisals of the following year where the police would go down and burn down the whole centre of a town, which of course had culminated with the burning out the centre of Cork City in December 1920. And instead, what happens is the military comes up and gives you a sheet of paper saying your house is being blown up in your official reprisal, please get out of the house. So, you know, if it's better, I don't know. But the IRA was short of weapons and ammunition, but they're determined to fight on and, you know, casualties rose in these months. They didn't fall, including Crown Forces casualties. Civilians were increasingly targeted by both sides. So the British in reprisals, um, the British would typically murder at nighttime in, in, by squads that could be denied IRA suspects, but they may, may or may not be an IRA. Um, they also tended to kill a lot of civilians kind of in checkpoints and so on um, when they failed to stop. And um, the IRA shot in this period, the six month period, about 200 people as alleged informers. So of the 2000 dead, about 700 are civilians. Now, at the same time, the peace process continued. Now, de Valera returned from America in late 1920. Interestingly, given later history, de Valera was identified by the British as a moderate. So they identified Michael Collins as very much the head of the military movement, um, which in theory he wasn't, but in practice he was. And de Valera as the leader of the political side. So they, think, they thought maybe we can talk to this man, de Valera. De Valera met with Lord Derby, who was a member of the House of Lords in April 1921, and requested talks without preconditions. So again, this willingness to talk, but inability to get there. De Valera and James Craig, who's the head of the Ulster Unionists, met in May 1921. And Cope continued secret contacts throughout Michael Collins throughout the period. So this thing of how do we get to this end goal? We know we can have a ceasefire and talk on the basis of Dominion Home Rule, but how do we stop the violence? And there's a good quote from um, Mark Anderson, or sorry, Mark Sturgis, excuse me, John Anderson, Mark Sturgis saying, uh, it's like a nightmare. We all know what the end goal is going to be, but how do we get there? So on May the 3rd, the cabinet, the British cabinet, voted against offering a truce by nine votes to five. So Lloyd George at this point says, I still won't move uh, into talking with these people before the arms are surrendered. And also I, I won't offer things like they can't have their own army and they can't have fiscal autonomy. As late as May 1921, he's still arguing this. Why is he holding out? Well, one reason is because the elections 
to Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland are supposed to be held late in May 1921. And the idea is, if you have these elections and if there's a large vote against Sinn Féin for moderate nationalists in the South and for unionists, then you've politically defeated the rebellion. So this is the hope. Now Sturgis, as I said, said it's a nightmare. One cannot really see if there's any material thing between us at all. If only this fencing for position would stop. So the government hopes though that they're going to have these elections, the Government of Ireland Act is going to come in, into power. It doesn't happen at all. So Sinn Féin swept the board in the south. They were elected unopposed in every constituency except for Trinity College Dublin in these elections of May 1921. So the possibility now is they'll have to rule Ireland as a crown colony. Now, what does this mean? It means that uh, Ireland will no longer be part of the United Kingdom. It will be ruled by the military for the period of the rebellion. And it's, it's possible. It's what they would have done in many parts of the world, but it's terrible PR. So uh, Churchill, for example, uh, says, this is getting us an odious reputation internationally. We really don't want to go down this route. We, went, we need a political solution in Ireland. Macready, who again has flip-flopped, Macready, the military commander-in-chief, he outlines the implications of martial law to the government. And he says, look, this involves uh, wholesale internment. It means confiscation of all transport in Ireland, civilian transport, down to the level of the bicycle. It means you have to have permits to go to the end of the street. And it means 100 executions every month. So we, sh we start shooting the prisoners by rote until they stop. He says, we have to go all out or get out. He says, if you're not prepared to go that far, then we need to, we need to talk because that's the, the length we need to go to to crush this rebellion as they saw it. Now, McCready, in many ways, is a reluctant warrior. He says, there are, of course, one or two wild people who go about, uh, there are, of course, one or two wild people about who still hold the absurd idea that if you go on killing long enough, peace will ensue. I do not believe it for a moment, but I do believe that the more people are killed, the more difficult will be the final solution. The government policy has basically failed by June 1921. They need to find a way out. And the key man who helps them do this is Jan Smuts here in the picture. Jan Smuts is here in the uniform of British general, but Jan Smuts is the future prime minister of South Africa. Um, he had been a leader of the Boer guerrillas against the British in the Boer War of 1900, 1901. And so, he has a foot in kind of both camps. He is a member of the British Empire, but he'd also fought against the British Empire at one point. He's approached by the Irish at, the, at a Commonwealth conference to ask them to mediate. And so Jan Smuts says to the British government, you know, this is, this is the perfect opportunity. He said, Northern Ireland is up and running now, so you have that out of the way. Um, your other policy has failed. Now is the time to talk. So Jan Smuts and Lloyd George for, uh, drafted a speech for the king the king had to make a speech at the opening of the Northern Ireland Parliament. Now, a lot is made of this, I think, mistakenly, saying that um, the, the king's intervention moved things along. That's not the case. So the king delivers the speech that's written for him by the prime minister and by Jan Smuts. And, but the king's speech is very much an invitation to talk. He says, today may prove to be the first step towards the end of strife. He says, all Irishmen must reach out and accept the hand of reconciliation and so on. So, but Northern Ireland is out of the way. Now you can talk on the basis of partition, really, but to the Republicans in the South. Lloyd George is now prepared. He's reversed his position of just a month before. He's prepared to offer a truce without preconditions to De Valera. And he's moved a lot since December, so he's prepared to talk about things like fiscal autonomy for Ireland. He's started to talk about an Irish army, Irish police, and so on. And so, on this basis, a truce is agreed. Now, the British uh, initially didn't want a formal truce. They wanted uh, a slackening off, as Churchill put it, uh, by both sides. Now, the Irish insisted there had to be a formal truce or hostilities would just break out again. So, uh, Macready met with Sinn Féin representatives, Neville Macready, the Commander-in-Chief, in Dublin Castle. Um, there wasn't a joint statement agreed, but both sides sent out uh, communiques to their own side saying that there was a truce to come into effect as of noon on July 11th, 1921. No hostile move by either side, no destruction of property, and liaison officers were established to monitor the truce. So people who had been wanted uh, Tom Barry is the famous example, were made liaison officers who had to meet with the British military regularly to make sure the truce was holding. Prisoners were not to be released, however, they were kept until after the treaty. Um, De Valera, the President of the Republic again, was to meet Lloyd George in, Dublin, in London. Now, Greenwood, Tudor, some of the military figures were disgusted, so these are the hardliners, but the civil servants, so the trio, as I mentioned, Andy Cope, John Anderson, Mark Sturgis, they'd really been vindicated, so their approach that they'd advocated over a year before had finally come to pass and hence this idea that it was an unnecessary number of graves we could have got this without got to this situation without the 2,000 odd dead now I'm not going to go into too much detail on the treaty but basically Lloyd George meets de Valera in the summer of 1921 
late summer of 1921 in London. And he tells him, I'll talk about anything except uh, an Irish Republic. You can't have an Irish Republic. You can't leave the British Empire. And De Valera knows immediately this is going to be a problem. Um, he doesn't accompany the negotiating team that goes to London to sign the treaty, famously led by Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith. Now, one thing to bear in mind, though, is remember, uh, as we went along in this peace process, Griffith and Collins said at an early stage, we will accept a settlement short of an Irish Republic. We want, you know, the substance of Irish independence, but we're prepared to compromise on the Irish Republic. And so that's what happens. Now, there's obviously great controversy that they signed the um, treaty without de Valera's approval. And for my money, this is a mistake, not so much because of the substance of the treaty, but because it created such disunity within Irish ranks afterwards. I think that um, Lloyd George gave them an ultimatum at the last minute that it was this or more war. And so Co Collins, Griffith and the other members of the delegation were kind of panicked into signing it. They may, have, they may have ended up signing it anyway, but they signed it without cabinet approval, which caused a lot of the subsequent problems. But briefly, on the terms of the treaty, so it created an Irish free state, a dominion of the British Empire. Now, one point that I I'm, I'm, hope I'm hammering home here is that this has been uh, uh, mooted all along by the people on the British side, uh, the peaceniks on the British side, as the solution. And finally, it becomes the solution in the short term anyway. Um, it recognised partition, but I think there's misconceptions about this. So the Northern Ireland is up and running since June of 1921. Its government is given executive powers in November 1921, so nearly a month before the treaty is signed. Um, however, the treaty negotiators didn't, didn't think that they were confirming partition because the article of the treaty on Northern Ireland says there's going to be a boundary commission to, the, to uh, draw the boundary, draw the border in accordance with the wishes of the population. So what they thought is, well, you know, a large part of Northern Ireland is nationalist. Uh, they're going to come in with us after the boundary commission. Northern Ireland is going to collapse. And this was the, the firm hope of the treaty negotiators. It didn't work out like that. Britain retained three strategic ports, so it retained ports in the south and one port up in Donegal. Um, the king was to be the head of state, so the formal head to which TDs had to swear, they had to swear uh, allegiance to the constitution of the Irish Free State and fidelity to the British monarch. And of course, this is one of the key points in the treaty debates in the south, um, that they're giving up the republic and they're voluntarily swearing allegiance to the king, you know, the, the symbol of all they've been fighting against. And famously, of course, this sparks the Irish Civil War in the following year. Now, I'm going to leave that to maybe our centenaries of, of next year. But I want to finish with just a wor word about this man, Andy Cope, the forgotten man. So Andy Cope had, had a very dirty job throughout like, the peace process. He had to do these deniable back-channel talks that the government denied were taking place the whole time. Um, there was a number of attempts when the... Um, IRA active service units, particularly the squad, uh, started trailing him with a view to assassinating him and Collins had to intervene to tell him not to. Um, he's given another dirty job after the treaty, which is the supervision of the transfer of power to the Irish provisional government that took over as the British administration left in 1922. Now, this was a job that had to be done in the midst of civil war, so the civil war breaking out in late June 1922. Um, Andy Cope was disliked intensely by people on his own side for his contacts with Sinn Féin. So McCready, the commander-in-chief, said he has not a large enough mind and no idea whatever of the dignity of empire. Um, he's accused of treason by Lord Muskery, so an Irish peer, Anglo-Irish peer, I suppose, in the House of Lords in 1924. So he's accused of having set up people on his own side to be killed. And this was not true. Um, and people weighed in on his side. Um, John Anderson, his boss in the civil service, said he didn't do anything that he wasn't told to do. But he, he's in the wilderness for several years afterwards because he's believed to have been a traitor by people on his own side, by people who viewed the treaty as, as a surrender to murderers and so on and uh, Irish rebels. Um, and finally, I think it's interesting to finish with Andy Cope's response to a request from the Bureau of Military History in 1950. Now, the Bureau of Military History is an oral history project that was set up um, to get the testimony of veterans of the revolutionary years, mostly Irish, but some on the British side. It was recognised by the people involved that Cope had been a central figure. Cope's, experience, Cope's response is interesting, though, because what Cope says, and you might remember Cope is someone who's been very sympathetic to the Irish Republicans, who's been behind the peace process to a very large degree. But what Cope says is, over the years, I have had offers from various sources for my views and experiences, but I've turned all of them down because I regard the period and also that following the treaty, so he's referencing the civil war there, which he also administered in, to be the most discreditable period of your country's history. It is preferable to forget it to let sleeping dogs lie. It is not possible for this history to be truthful. 
the IRA must be shown as national heroes and British forces as brutal oppressors. Accordingly, the truce and the treaty will have been brought about by the defeat of the British, by the valour of the small and well-equipped groups of regulars, and so on. What a travesty it will be and must be. So, interestingly, by this point, Cope's view is that, you know, there had been a peace process that was viable all along, and the militarists on both sides, but he also blames the Irish for this, uh, spun it out, and too many people died before you got to the point which they'd flagged early in proceedings. Now, I'm not saying that Cope is necessarily right there, because Lloyd George and the top of the British administration, both in London and in Dublin, are really not prepared to move until June 1921. But it's interesting that that's Cope's view. Now, Cope, in response to all his kind of hardships and um, the, the shunning he, he got from really the establishment, he got religion in the years in between, and he, he became quite a religious man. And it's interesting, just to finish with his final quote here, he said, Ireland has too many histories, she deserves a rest. Her present need is a missionary to teach her that love, not hate, is still the only password, both to earthly happiness and to the heavenly kingdom. So, you know, this is Cope's view as a, a kind of committed Christian by 1950. So just to finish, um, the peace process, like a lot of such processes, was something where a certain group of people certainly had mapped out where it was going to go uh, from the start. And the problem was getting there. The problem was getting all the people on, on all sides to agree that this was the only way forward. Now, I will say one thing against this point of view, though, which is that if you look at on the Irish side, um, the offer of dominion home rule is the thing that caused the civil war. So, it, and it's the thing that Lloyd George insist, and the other British negotiators of the treaty insist that can't be changed in the treaty negotiations. So if you look at it, if you turn things around and look at things from the Irish point of view, it might not, it might not look so good. It might look different. It might look to what, like the, Brit, the British kind of manipulated a solution that was going to cause civil war among the Republican movement in the end. However, I would say this, I would say that had there been as early as 1918, 1919, more wish to talk about the issues, especially on the British side, more listening to the people on their own side who advocated for a political solution, we might have been spared all, as Warren Fisher said, the unnecessary number of graves. Thank you very much.